Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Baruch Halpern. Professor Baruch Halpern graduated Harvard with a Bachelor of Arts, Master of Arts, and a PhD under the tutelage of Frank Moore Cross, George Ernest Wright, Thomas O. Lambden, and Forkill Jacobson. Baruch Halpern spent 16 years at York University in Toronto, moving to Penn State in 1992, Pennsylvania State in 1992. He also was the leader of the archaeological digs at Tel Megiddo. His publications include four books, the most recent of which was David's Secret Demons, and a number of edited volumes and articles. Now, today's topic will, will center on David's Secret Demons. In David's Secret Demons, Baruch Halpern distinguishes the historical King David from the mythical and exaggerated version of the historical figure that we get in the Hebrew Bible. Well, welcome to History Valley, Baruch Halpern. Thank you for having me. So, um, tell us. What led to you to look upon David's critics to decipher the historical David? It's an interesting story. The question that was raging at the time that I started to investigate the David story was whether David existed and whether he was a concoction as Philip Davis uh, wrote like King Arthur. Hmm. Um, and I thought maybe in looking at the historiography, we could perhaps uncover the questions that the history writer was trying to answer. So when we read the book of Samuel, we tend to just say, okay, this is the way it was. So in fact, that's how we read most books. This, mm. is, this is the way it was. And in fact, just as I was trying to answer a bunch of critics who denied the existence of David, the author of Samuel was writing to answer a bunch of questions that were alive at the time that he was writing. And mm. they were questions about David as well. For him, they were more important because they had implications for the legitimacy of the dynasty. But the process is the same. You're always defining yourself. You're always defining your arguments in terms that are set for you by what people are talking about in the environment. So, in reading the the book, I just, I came to the conclusion that David had been alibied for a series of killings. Hmm. The one he wasn't alibied for was the killing of Uriah, but he was alibied for probably about, well, upward of a dozen other executions or deaths. And that led me to the, to the question, why are we getting such so many alibis? Hmm. Okay, and so yeah, it, it, I I I concluded in my own head. I will admit that these were the questions that were on the minds of people around David. That that these accusations were in fact live accusations that his opponents were using and the exist in other words you don't invent an idealized character and make him alibied for 14 killings you you invent an idealized character and and explain maybe why a killing or two is necessary but but taking david elaborately out of the court of uh Achish, king of Gath, or taking David elaborately away from the battle in which Saul is killed. He wasn't there. Mm -hmm. he, he was out chasing Amalekites. Uh, he, yes, he, was, he went with the Philistines originally, but they sent him home. Um, and he was the one who killed the Amalekite who killed Saul. Hmm. That kind of elaborate denial of his complicity in Saul's death suggests that there were people who were worried about an accusation that he was complicit in Saul's death. 
And therefore, David really did exist. Because those are not accusations that you answer when you create a fictional, idealized character. Hmm. You don't create the, let me put it differently. You don't create the accusations of your idealized character. You answer real accusations or real concern. Hmm. Now about um, the accountant for Samuel, I know that most scholars will say Samuel did not write Samuel. Um, do you think that Samuel, the historical Samuel, wrote a draft and then somebody wrote the rest of it later or something like that? Or do you think they were they were just familiar with what he said and they added it into the text? Or? Well, if you recall, Samuel dies um, in 1 Samuel mm -hmm. 25. And the, the, the naming of books in the Bible isn't the naming of their authors necessarily. We have the five books of Moses, which only became the five books of Moses sometime in the Hellenistic period. Before that, we don't know what they were called. Deuteronomy was called the Torah or instruction, the oracular interpretation, the interpretation of revelation by, uh, it was called the Torah of Moses. Mm. But that referred only to Deuteronomy until the Hellenistic period. So with, with Joshua, Joshua is probably, Joshua is not the author of Joshua. The book is about Joshua. Uh, Samuel is not the author of Samuel. The book starts by being about Samuel in the introduction of kingship. Mm -hmm. uh, Kings is not written by kings. It's written about kings. Uh, when you get to the prophets, however, of course, Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel are the authors of the books, which start with, very important, the, the introduction, these are the words of Jeremiah, son of so and so, son of Hilkiah from Anatote, from the priests in Anatote. Hmm. We're told these are the words of that author in the case of prophetic books. Not in the case of the historical books. So, with, so, what, so that being said, because basically you said that um, Deuteronomy was originally just called the Torah. Does that insinuate at all that Deuteronomy was the first complete book? Because I know that there are some scholars that put Deuteronomy first in the documentary hypothesis scenario. Deuteronomy is an interesting case because we have the story of its discovery hmm. and that story places the discovery in 622 BC in the court of King Josiah. Hmm. He finds a book, he gets it validated by a prophetess. And at the end of the story, we are told it is the book of the Torah of Moses. The, uh, and then there are a number of references to Deuteronomy in that story, specifically to Deuteronomy. And even early exegetes like Jerome say this book is the book of Deuteronomy that Josiah found. So for, for a long period, it was, it was understood that Deuteronomy was the Torah of Moses. Okay. Is it the first is a more difficult question because his, if you think as a historian, our first evidence for the existence of this book is in 622 BC. Hmm. And how far back you want to push it, that doesn't tell you it was written in 622 BC, but how far back you want to push it beyond 622 BC is a very difficult question. Most people today regard it as from, from 622 or later. 
quite honestly. They think the story was made up, which I do not. But that's the world into which Deuteronomy really does fit. In other words, if you look at the landscape presupposed by Deuteronomy, if you look at the specific clauses in Deuteronomy that appear elsewhere, not in the Bible, but outside the Bible, if, mm -hmm. if you look at the integration of Deuteronomy with the Book of Kings, which is very complicated again, but, but fairly strong, there, there's a very good argument to be made that this is a document basically from the 7th century BC, from the time of Assyria's domination of Judah. Hmm. So returning to the uh, our discussion on David, um, the, the Taldan Stila, um, which has been uh, long understood as having a, a mentioned the House of David, um, does this at all seem to fit what we're told about David overall in the Old Testament? Or are there some things here? Because what I'm curious, what I'm curious about is are there some things here that it reveals that are different at all? To be quite honest, David is identified in this Stella only as the founder of a dynasty, as you can mm -hmm. see in your line nine. Um, the names that appear here are consistent with what we have in the books of kings mm -hmm. which is exactly what i'd expect and the information we derive from this with any certainty is only that the war god of the king who wrote it was Hadad. Presumably, mm -hmm. Hadad was the war god of Damascus, we assume. And we assume that this is this is a Damascene document because Hazael is the one who, uh, who enters combat with the two kings who are probably named. But the whole thing is very fragmentary. I, you can see how fragmentary it is. Mm -hmm. We're filling in parts of the names of everybody except David in this Stella. Hmm. Every name except, oh, uh, hey, Dad. But, but every name except David is restored. I think it's restored correct. I think the names are restored correctly. But it's a very fragmentary little piece. It tends to confirm the, the storyline in Kings that there was a conflict between Hazael of Damascus and these kings of Israel and Judah in the ninth century. But this Stella can't be from before about 835, eight, so 100 years, 150 years after David's heyday. Hmm. How do... Um... How do people uh, get that claim that David didn't exist get around this evidence? Well, they, <laughs> they at first <clears throat> denied that the word David, uh, D W D in in Hebrew writing, was David, and so suggested that it was the name of a god who is otherwise very marginally attested, Daoud, hmm. a god about whom we know nothing. The, 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 in fact, a god who may not exist. They argued that it could be the word for pot, like a ceramic pot. Hmm. But neither the house of a god named Daoud nor the house of a pot makes much sense. And in this context, there's not much doubt that by, by the 830s, for sure, and of course, I would argue, or earlier, David was known as the founder of the dynasty of the, of the tribe of Judah. 
Hmm. Do you think um, that the historical David really did descend from Judah and had a father called Jesse and all those things? Or do you think uh, there could have been some uh, enhancements going on there? That's a really good question. And very controverted. Hmm. What do we mean? One of the problems in dealing with this early material in the Bible, and this is regard, this is the early the earliest historical material we have, judges and Samuel, that are that are not celebrated as part of the religion of Israel, not 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 part of the liturgy. Hmm. It, one of the problems in getting at the early Israelite milieu is what do we mean by Israel? What do we mean by Israelite? What do we mean by Judahite? Judah, if you recollect, is not mentioned in the Song of Deborah. It doesn't appear. And yet Deborah seems to be trying to enumerate all the tribes of Israel. Hmm. We have no archaeological evidence of the kind of settlement we identify with Israel in Judah until just around David's time. So when we ask ourselves what a Judahite is, what is that community? We should really be asking how Judah became Judah, how it came to be named Judah, how it came, how it came to incorporate the elements it does. There are Kenizzites in Judah who are regarded as non-Israelite in some texts but regarded as Judahite in others. The identities are a little bit fluid. I'm, I'm not saying that they were totally up for grabs or, or anything like that, but there's a period in which, and the early period is it, mainly in the period of the judges, but even as late as David, there's a period in which absorption of local elements into the framework of an Israel that operates as a group is still ongoing. And if you look at something like the inhabitants of Gibeon, they're identified as alien, as, as non-Israelite in Joshua and in Genesis and in, well, in effect, the Shechemites, um, in, in a number of, passages, including, importantly, Samuel. Saul wages war on the Gibeonites because in his zeal for God. So the Gibeonites are regarded as aliens in these texts. And yet, by the time we come to Jeremiah, the Gibeonites are actually part of Israel. And in fact, even in Samuel, Kiryat Yarim, the a, a, the city that houses the ark hmm. before it goes to Jerusalem. It's a Gibeonite city in, in Joshua. It's regarded as, as non-Israelite. So how these things become tribes, how they become units, is a big issue. Okay, where is David's, I have no doubt David's father's name is right. Mm -hmm. And I imagine his father was pretty important, quite honestly. But the question of what group they belonged to is a question of what groups had formed into units around them. You might think he was a Benjaminite. You might think he was a Gibeonite. You might think he was something else. I don't, I, I don't know how we get at that, except adoptively and functionally, by the time he becomes king of Judah, he's an Israelite. Hmm. I wanted to ask you real quick about First Samuel, because uh, I know you talk about the Dead Sea Scroll, First Samuel, and I'm, we're going to be getting into this even more in our next talk about the dating of the Old Testament. Uh, um, you said that it parallels the Septuagint closer than the uh, 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 the the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. 
uh, something like that. There are play. I actually let, let's nuance that a little bit. Okay. How how do we get these texts? Mm -hmm. Was was there one original? I have to think there was myself, but everybody in text criticism today denies that there was a single original. Mm -hmm. From which copies were made. And where were those copies made? And how many copies were made? And were they collated against one another? Did they, were they all perfect? Obviously not. Mm. They, they differ from one another. And even when, when we start around 1000 AD, which is roughly the time of our earliest Hebrew manuscripts outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have an enormous number of variants among in the in just the the tradition in the Hebrew, the official I don't know what to call it the the shared text of the Hebrew Bible has about as a total has about fifty thousand variants in it just from the Hebrew. Then, if you add the evidence from the translations, the evidence from Ethiopic, the evidence from, from the early, trend, the Greek is the earliest translation, but the Ethiopic, the old Latin, the Vulgate, the, by the time you add all that in, I don't know how many variants we're really talking about, but it's an awful lot of variants between the texts. 95% of those variants are insignificant. There are only a few that are that are large variants, but they stand out. And there are a couple of them in 1 Samuel. All right. In Qumran, we have two pretty full copies of Samuel and, and one not so full copy of Samuel, uh, plus fragments here and there. We have also at least two Greek versions with a zillion variants as well, because they've been copied and edited. And, and by edited, I mean that they've been, they've been made to come closer to what the translator thought was the original text, hmm. or the meaning of the original text. So they're improved over time, if you, if you like. We, this is supposed to be the second edition, the third edition, and so on. So we, we have at least two of those in Greek, two separate translations. And we have in uh, Qumran, uh, I mentioned Qumran, I'm sorry. Mm. Take a passage like the beginning of 1 Samuel 11, where Saul is said to have rescued the city of Jabesh Gilead. That's that chapter. In the Hebrew Bible, we've got a situation in which all of a sudden Nachash the Ammonite is attacking the city of Jabesh. But in the, in the Septuagint, there's a slightly longer version. In, in Josephus, who is earlier, sorry, who is earlier than any of our, Hebrew texts, other than the Qumran texts, we have the story that, that Nachash the Ammonite had been attacking the Israelites for a while. And this is more or less what we get in, in the Greek as well, the old Greek. Mm. It's gone from, from later Greek translations. So the old Greek has it, and the later Greek translations do not. We found the passage at Qumran. And the passage is that Saul had been beating up on Reubenites and Gadites, and he finally got up. They had all fled into the city of Jabesh. So this was basically a city that was jammed with refugees who the Ammonites were out to subdue, to subject. And that is when Saul's, the appeal to Saul is made. Hmm. 
the Qumran text is clearly, to my mind, the original. Now, of course, mm. the thing is controverted. There are people who say different. But it explains not just the Septuagint, but Josephus, which is not insignificant because Josephus was reading these texts when he wrote his Antiquities of the Jews. In this one, in this one instance, the Septuagint is, is a little closer to the Qumran scroll. Than the, than the Hebrew is, but they're both missing this massive amount of, of text mm. <laughs> that we find in Qumran, and and it's that text that explains what's going on in in the transmission of Samuel over time. You have to look, but you have to look at each case individually to see what's happened, because sometimes half a line will slip out because the scribe's eye simply skipped over it when he was copying. And in some cases, half a line will be added because somebody felt the need to explain a, an obscure expression and that got copied into the manuscript. There's a soup really out there of text if you add all these translations and Hebrew versions and, and Greek versions and what have you, in, and Josephus and references in the, in the church fathers, if you, if you add all that in, you trying to reconstruct an original text is sort of like trying to pull all of the grains of barley out, out of a very complex vegetable soup. Mm. It, 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 can only be done notionally. It can't be done with certainty in many, many, many cases. Mm. In the, uh, in the uh, real story of King David, um, did he really defeat a guy called Goliath? Obviously <laughs> not, not, not as huge as described in the Bible, but just some ordinary guy called Goliath. My teacher was a man who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls mm. when they were first opened up to scholars. And he received a letter from a correspondent who was working on the Dead Sea Scrolls at the time. Mm. He, he had sent Pat Skian, was the name of the correspondent. Frank Cross was the name of my teacher. Uh, Frank had sent Skian a note saying that Goliath, uh, by his measurement, was about six foot six because Frank had a, had a different cubit. And, and uh -huh. Skian wrote back, my God, this was a giant in the days of David. And today he couldn't even play power forward in the NBA. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just had to tell the story. But the... Um, Goliath is a type character, obviously, and he is the sort of character that David's heroes are listed as fighting in 2 Samuel 21 and 23. He's a, I think, a combination of characters. Did David, did David ever fight a warrior of that sort well to be honest in that same list where his heroes fight people we're told that elchanan the son of dodo from bethlehem was the one who fought goliath chronicles turns that into elchanan fought the brother of Eliah of goliath mm -hmm. which relieves the problem but it really looks like the name has been taken from another exploit by another person. And the question I even pose here is whether David, whether this is a way, whether this is the kind of George Washington threw a dollar across the Potomac story <laughs> about a founder. I mean, you tell these stories in the same way as, as David had real enemies, who accused him of all sorts of things, some of which he may have been guilty of. I don't know which exactly, but have suspicions. But but 
in the same way that you tell your your opponents tell negative stories about you that are untrue, your proponents tell positive stories about you. They become part of a kind of folklore of personality. It's more important for the for the dynasty founder than for anyone else, and that's why David and Solomon attract the kind of stories about character that we don't get about most of the rest of the kings. So no, I don't think there was ever a, a fight with Goliath in the, the Wadi Ela involving David. So and, was another guy, Elkanah. Yeah, Elkanah. Yeah. Elkanah. Yeah. Okay. So you think he was the one that actually killed Goliath? Yeah, I, I okay. believe that notice, yes. So then why did they why did they decide to pick that story and give it to David? What was the point of that? I don't think the point of the story is actually Goliath's name. Mm. I think the point of the story is to illustrate that David was indeed marked for greatness from the very beginning of his young adulthood. Mm even younger. The heart of the story, no, no matter how you slice it, is that everybody else is afraid to go and fight this guy. But David is a shepherd who trusts God and who has been killing wild animals with his sling for a hundred years or, or ever since he was like three. The, <laughs> the object here is, is, for David to go out there and, yeah, put that stone in the middle of Goliath's forehead. Um, it's a story of incredible bravery, but the battle doesn't ever have to have happened. There, there doesn't ever have to have been a fight in the Wadi Ela. It is in territory that is right on the border between Israel and Philistia. There may have been a fight there. But the idea, really, quite honestly, of two armies sitting out in that turf for a number of days, weeks, in fact, and just facing each other seems a little... Yeah, that seems Arthur-esque. I, I, I mean, I think that's one of the one of the stories that gives grist to the mill of people who deny that David is a, anything but a literary character. Mm. So when did um, actually not when I'm I'm gonna since Goliath was supposed to have been placed in David's time. Yeah, there's uh, Elkanah. Uh, I think I mispronounced his name again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did did he? Did he kill Goliath contemporaneously with David, or was that, or was it, or did this take place in another time? That's a good question, but I, I imagine. Look, I, this is a question of how you evaluate the sources in at the end of Second Samuel. So in Second Samuel twenty-one, I think it's nineteen, Elchanan kills Goliath, but it's in a list there of the exploits of David's heroes. Hmm. Now, that list continues in 2 Samuel 23, where it gives you a whole list of who his heroes were. The important thing to me is that I'm, I'm not looking at texts that particularly lionize David himself. They don't lionize his family. They're simply accounts of, of accomplishments or exploits by his, his people. And... In Near Eastern literature in general, not that Israelite literature is exactly like the rest of the Near East, because it is very different. But in, in the literature we know of in the Near East, we don't, we, the kings write, we don't get this kind of list of heroes. We don't get the, the names of people who had wonderful exploits on the battlefield. We rarely get the name of anybody but the king, in fact. So when I see something like this and I see the way it's structured, I think, why, why is it there? Why did they put it in? 
And the, and the answer to, to my mind is these were important people. Their families were important. They were powerful. David was, or, or rather, whoever wrote this, really, Solomon, maybe, making alliances by including the names of these people. He was creating a nobility. These are the supporters of the Davidic dynasty, these, these people and their families. And as a result, yes, I think he must have been contemporary with David. Hmm. Do you think that King David did fight the Philistines? Good question. Which Philistines? And I will answer. <laughs> because hmm. he didn't fight the Gittites. That's hmm. very clear. Solomon actually extradites, uh, or rather, uh, under Solomon, a uh, opponent of Solomon and of David, Shimei, a, a, a relative of Saul, actually extradites a couple of slaves from, from Gat to Jerusalem. And that indicates that relations were pretty good. The Philistines are often treated as a single group because Israelite literature tends to be metonymic in that way. We don't hear that David fought the Philistines because we don't get the word the Philistines very often unless it's a reference to particular Philistines. Hmm. We, we get David fought Philistines or Philistines did this. And from that, you have to parse out which Philistines, because there are five sovereign states in Philistia, just, just like Greek city-states right next to each other, but, but they're separately governed. When the city of Gat is thriving, the city of Ekron is not. When the city of Ekron is thriving, the city of Gat is not. There are divisions among the Philistines, and they obviously fought with one another as well as with other people. So the question is really, yeah, which Philistines did David fight? And yes, he must have fought some, depending on what we mean by Philistine. But which of them, I wouldn't want to even hazard a guess. Hmm. So he could have he could have been in conflict with different people that were called philistines there's not necessarily just one people in that case right exactly and it might not even be philistines that we would recognize unfortunately even uh, there's an, a huge debate in the archaeological community today which was i think intelligently created by uh the excavator of gat aaron meyer um his point was that the word Philistines designates one particular kind of people, but there's no guarantee that, that among the Philistines, everybody was a Philistine. Hmm. It's the same sort of problem as Judah. How do we come to have these blocks of people that collaborate? Now, the Philistines never collaborate after Samuel that we know of. They are never a unit after Samuel. It's always city by city. But how do, how, do, how do we parse out Yeah, which part of Philistine is a part that makes you act together and which part of Philistine is a part that just makes you maybe do business together or prefer to drink together or whatever. The, there, these issues of of the labels are, are bigger than we ever recognize. Hmm. What do you think of the claim that is made by some people that, okay, there's pictures out there of people supposedly having done archaeology that found uh, Goliath with, with, or something like that, or giants. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Actually, the librarian, one of the, one of the, at Penn State, I used to get from the library copies of 
these claims from time to time, they would just send them over because they were mm. fun. And one of them was a huge picture on the front of some supermarket screaming paper that uh, of, of a skull with a stone implanted in the middle of the forehead. And uh, the, the headline read, Goliath found in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> you gotta love that. I, I adore that stuff myself. Um, yeah, it, it it's a little bit crazy when they say stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. I, every time somebody finds Noah's Ark or whatever else they find, I'm delighted. I think it's it's fun and it's it's bad enough in the field as things stand, let me tell you. We're not always completely oriented, not always able to identify what we're finding. And then these guys go out and find like Goliath's head. I think that's wonderful. I mean, they are more certain than I am. When I dig, when I dig a site and I find a house, or when I find bones, the people who find Goliath and the giants are more certain than I am that that they know what they're dealing with. And and considering that I have a team when I'm digging of experts in things like bones, yeah, this is it's impressive. I really enjoyed it. I'm sorry. So. Um... So basically the question I'm asking about that is like they'll say, well, look at this huge skeleton. It's the size of my entire body or something like that. Uh, the skeleton didn't really exist. They never really found anything. It was a, it was a forged picture. Oh, even better. Mm. Virtual archaeology might be the best idea that anyone's ever had where you don't actually dig. You just invent what's under the ground. Oh, because every time we dig, we destroy evidence. Hmm. And it's sort of like buying a computer there for it. The time to, to dig is always 20 years from now. <laughs> okay, I think uh, my last couple of questions will be involving uh, David and Saul. Um, so you think, so based on what you were saying earlier, you think David murdered Saul? I think he was at the Battle of Gilboa. Yeah. Okay. What What was the real reason David and Saul were fighting each other? What was the deal? Power. Pure and mm. simple. Okay. Now, David is really working hand in glove with, with the king of Gad, for whom he worked. And Saul... We have stories about how David was a loyal Israelite and he was at Saul's court and was driven out and mm -hmm. forced to become a part of the Philistine war machine and given a piece of Philistine territory by the Philistines. Mm -hmm. Saul represents a xenophobic Israelite force. A very, you can call it high patriotism, but he, he wages war on people he defines as not being Israelite. It doesn't really matter in this connection who's Israelite or who isn't Israelite. It matters who Saul defines as Israelite and as non-Israelite. So he attacks the Gibeonites and their allies. He attacks uh, nomads, Amalekites. We have, a, we have a list at the end of 1 Samuel 14 of a number of, of polities that he attacks. That said, David allies with the Gibeonites and in fact kills Saul's offspring to make the Gibeonites happy as vengeance for Saul's attack on them. He admits all sorts of Calebites and, and Kenizzites and what have you into the what becomes Judah under probably under him or just before he 
forges alliances apparently with Hiram of Tyre and with shockingly Nachash the king of Ammon at whose death he sends a delegation to console the, the sons. Now that is a remarkable, that's a remarkable detail because if you remember Nachash the king of Ammon was the guy against whom Saul made his reputation by rescuing the city of Jabesh Gilead. David's a friend of Nachash. He's good. He's got diplomatic relations with him. David, David is a more ecumenical, more modern, more, more coastal character than Saul. And the fight is really about, it seems to me, where, aside from the personal element, the personal ambitions involved, where the population that David defines as Israel versus the population of Saul, that Saul defines as Israel will find its place in the neighborhood. Is it going to be at war with all its neighbors or is it going to try and forge alliances with its neighbors? Is that, that kind of issue. So it's a policy issue as well as a power issue. It's not just personal. Okay. Brett Forsa, thank you for the five dollar super chat. Um, his question for you uh, uh, is: If the northern tribes are worshiping pagan gods, then wouldn't it be David's obligation to defend the borders of those who worship Hashim? Hashem. Hashem. Uh, the. Can I see that again? Yeah. Thanks. Ooh, this is a really good question, and I, I it it doesn't it defies a very quick answer. However, hmm. the issue that I want to call your attention to, Mr. Forsyth, is that the religions that we're talking about have many, many supernatural beings. I don't care whether you call them gods, as they did, or whether you call them angels and demons, but they had hosts of, of supernatural being, which is why God is called Yahweh of hosts. These gods are fundamentally innocuous. They're the gods of the hearth, the god of the fire that you're kindling. The, I, they're the spirits that you know everywhere in every society. The other gods, however, that the Bible talks about, when it talks about other gods, you shall have no other god in front of me. And literally, that's a better translation, by the way, than before me. Hmm. The, the Bible is talking about state gods when it talks about other gods. In other words, Yahweh, Hashem, is the God of Israel, and it is what marks an Israelite out as belonging to a different community than an Aramean who worships Hadad, or a Philistine who worships Dagon, who, by the way, is a Hittite god named Kumar. Mm. But the so so he doesn't have an obligation really to fight any god. Except if that if there's a danger that groups of Israelites will secede and worship that God, because when you worship a foreign God, it means you're a member of a foreign community. When Saul, this is so good, when Saul finally reconciles with David, when the second time David doesn't kill him, <laughs> Samuel 26. David says to him, you know, those men around you, they set you against me and they, they said to me, go worship other gods. That means they expelled me from your society, from Israelite society. So what does David do? He goes to 
the city of Gat of the Philistines and worked for Achish, king of Gat. Well, as a member of the royal cabinet, as a member of the bodyguard at the end, he's responsible to at least be respectful of Achish's God. Go worship other gods means go join another society. And so in the same sense, David has no obligation to change other societies. He has an obligation in his own mind, a desire to keep his society together. That is to keep his people, his supporters, worshiping Hashem and not, hmm. not paying primary tribute to this other God next door, to this other state God. Notice that, though, that when Solomon is establishing himself, he builds shrines to Kamosh, to Ash Ashtoret. Uh, these, are, these are perfectly okay to tolerate in the time of David. They're just not in the, the state temple. They're not state gods. And that's a huge distinction. Hmm. Well, thanks for joining me, uh, Professor Halpern. I really did enjoy this uh, discussion. And next time we're going to be getting into the dating of the Old Testament. I'll have the uh, live stream uh, put up on the on the schedule so all of you guys will see it. Um, so keep an eye out for it. And then we're going to be talking about why a third century BCE dating for the Torah doesn't work. Uh That'll be next time. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.